We went to the 2019 24 Hours of Le Mans with Bentley and got to experience some new and classic Bentleys on the drive down and even got to take them out for a parade lap around Le Sarth. All around us were cars spanning the entire 100 year history of the mark, including the 2003 Le Mans winning car, and highlights from every single decade. Stealing the show, however, were a couple of Bentley blowers, one of which was driven by Derek Bell, five times Le Mans winner and all round racing legend. We were able to grab him for an interview just as the race started to ask him the questions you had sent us on Instagram. Derek, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time during the 24 hours of uh, Le Mans. Uh, the 2019 race has just started and obviously yeah. as someone with a huge amount of experience, what would, what would have been going through the minds of the drivers just before they get started as someone with as much experience as you? Actually, all we're really thinking is we're going to say, let's get on with the race because it's been talked about since last year. You really start working out and getting in shape for it from Christmas onwards. And the build-up has been immense. You've had the test weekend, and suddenly it's the coming together of all the major sports pro programs you do in the world. And they're coming together at the world's greatest sports car racetrack, and you just want to get on with it. But the build-up in this last few days gets so slow from the, the scrutineering in yep. Plaza de la Republic on the Monday and the Tuesday, and then practice on the qualifying on the Wednesday afternoon, and Thursday afternoon, and Friday is free, but you have to, all your sort of sponsorship type meetings to go to you're actually ready for the race because you want to you know um, get on and just see that green flag and go because that's what you are doing you came for and so you know once you once the race is on you know you're not nervous anymore you're away and once you've done each of you have done a stint the chap that does the first stint or double stint maybe at the start is under the most pressure because really? he's been worried about it for weeks and he's got to contend with the start. Yeah. When you jump in, the, the race is spread out by then and your car is not nose to tail, necessarily. it could be a, a second or two apart, but you're still going hell for leather, but you can just get out and get up to your own pace and, and blend in because everybody else has to do the same. So is it, is it you're then personally pr preference to start with that extra pressure to take that pressure on or would you always prefer to have a second or third stint I, uh, well I, but basically you have to remember I did it when we did two drivers so we yeah. had a first and second stint for many years and in fact having two drivers we had we had, I was talking about it last night we have a we seem to have a better relationship because it's just two of you yeah and we can talk if there was a third you always got yeah you got that mic you know and you keep talking across to the third person I think the two of you is very very special I didn't mind doing the start but if my teammate wanted to do it like Jackie Hicks did most yeah. occasions and Stuck did and they loved that that opening bit of extra excitement and I you know I've been around a while and I just said yeah, if they want to do it they can do it I would often start, uh, sometimes we did it that way, that the alternate years we'd start, um, but it's just another start, and it's one of course you don't want to make a mistake and crash the car because there's so much effort's gone into this yeah. event, you know, and um, there's another guy gone off, he won't sleep well for a while, <laughs> anyway, um, but it is really very, very tough um, if you're the first, I think, first person in, but as soon as you put the seatbelts on, you're away. Uh, and when you're the second the driver to get in next, you again are nervous, quite nervous, because you haven't been out on the track, you don't know what to expect, you don't know where there's oil, you don't know where there's gravel on the road, uh, you don't know how the car character has changed maybe since you drove it last. Um, but having said that, once you've got in it and driven it, you're fine. We got lots of questions in. One of the, one of the questions uh, I thought was uh, quite interesting because I'd never really thought about it, and you kind of alluded to it there, is uh, on a race that's as long as, as Le Mans and putting yeah. in so many laps, is there ever um, laps that are the same time after time or is each lap still unique? Does it have its own challenges? Um, some people put it a slightly different way. They say, do you ever get bored? Do you ever lose concentration? Um, the way you're asking it, um, every lap is, a, is, a, is, is another lap. Uh, but answering my question, the questions I get about it is the fact that I'm always trying to go better. I wouldn't know that it necessarily meant quicker. I'm trying to get the car more efficient. And every, every braking I do, every turning in point that I make for every corner, every apex I get, I try to get within a fraction of an inch. And the whole challenge of that race is to get it to the maximum because the neater and tidier I am, the faster I'm going to go and the more consistent I'm going to be. And I don't think I ever found it difficult being consistent. You get in such an amazing rhythm as the race progresses, yet when you've done qualifying, 
and you go and see how hard you tried because you only got a few laps at yeah. a time. Suddenly you're out there doing two lots of 20 laps or whatever, or 12 laps, whatever it is at Le Mans, and, and you get in a magnificent rhythm. And then the more, lap, more hours you do of this, as you go through it, um, you'll find that you're, you know, you're putting new tires on each time you stop and you go out. And you're just trying to perfect it. And I was always trying to perfect my lap the whole time I went. So, so there is, with the tire degradation, and, and, yeah. and there is slight differences, but you're striving to make it almost as boring as possible, to, to be as precise yes, that's and right. equal as possible. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you didn't have that challenge, I wouldn't enjoy it. I mean, I would get bored, but I, don't, I didn't. As I say, I found it the challenge of getting perfection all the time and then seeing the time come out is that you've done a good time to go, yeah, I know why I was quicker there. Or you, or you know why that lap you were quicker and you know where you did it. Mm. And it's trying to be perfect. And remember, at the same time, you're overtaking other cars. Yeah. Particularly in the, you know, I was lucky enough to drive the quick cars most of the time. So, you know, you're overtaking and you're waiting, you know, backing time out so that, and, you know, you come down to a corner behind, let's say, a Porsche 911 in the 962 and we're coming up at 230 and they're doing 190, which is only 40 mile an hour, but it's at a very high speed. Yeah. And I'd come up behind him and I'd think, no, let him, why, I won't go by now, I'll let him, a certain, I mean, it was very fine judgment, I'll let him take the corner. Because why do I want to go down the inside of him, which means I turn into a tighter corner, it's, it's screwed up his lap, and it means I can't come out quickly. So why not just back off that tenth of a second, let him go through the corner, I'll go through at the same speed that I was going to, but I just happened to lift off first went through the corner quickly and overtake him easier on the straight bit afterwards. And that's, that was sort of my mentality about it. Brilliant. Um, you mentioned uh, Hans-Jochen Stuck and uh, Jackie Ickes. Of everyone that you race with uh, in teams, uh, either in separate cars or, or in, in the same car like in endurance racing, was there anyone you felt you had the closest connection to who you felt that the, the, the two of you worked the, the best together? But you just said the point, the two of you worked best together. I always worked tremendously with uh, with, with Hans Stuck. I worked tremendously with Al Holbert, my American teammate. Uh, I mean, one year, Stuckey, uh, sorry, Al and I run the Daytona 24 hour and then Le Mans 24 hour. And the next year, Daytona 24 hour and Le Mans 24 hour. Nobody else has ever done the two sort of double whammies. In America, we had a young American driving with us and in, over here, we sort of drove over here with, with um, you know, a European driver. And so we always had a tremendous, uh, well, we had Hans Stuck over here when I won with Al in the O2 races. So I had great drivers with me, but you have a different relationship with three than you have with two. Yeah. I can't tell you what it is, but when there's two, there's a much more of a rely relying on the other driver because if there's something wrong with him, I'm, in a, I'm never gonna finish the race and vice versa. With three, you always, maybe it makes you at ease more, because you know that the two drivers could easily do the race on their own without you if you fell sick. Between um, your first and last races at Le Mans, which, but there's a variety of not just cars, but also uh, teams within that. Yeah. Were they all so completely different that it would be hard to choose a favorite or do you have an outright favorite that within those that you I mean, you the outright most? favorite had to be Porsche. Without a doubt, I mean, I did Le Mans, I, actually I don't know how many times in Le Mans, but I won it four times with them and I would say I mean I probably out of the 26 times I probably did it 18 times for Porsche I would think I mean or 16 certainly it was just I never thought of that question actually but it had to be Porsche they were so, they were they were perfect and when you've had such success with them you've got to think it your you know the greatest part of your life racing wise any particular one of the of the Porsche cars though um, Basically, and it's my normal answer, the most memorable car of my life was the Porsche 917 because of what it was, what it represented, and when it came out. It was, 19, it was my second year here. I drove a Ferrari 512 the first year in yeah. 70, and in 71, the 917. And, um, you know, driving uh, you know, that car there was with Joseph, we were actually doing 246 miles an hour, as we said, down the Mulsanne. Right, we never did that speed thereafter. And then what happened is we then had cars with a certain amount of ground effects. It was 10 years later with a 956 and 962. 
and so the car was more stable plus it was not as quick in a straight line but it was stability was immense and you could drive along with one hand hit everywhere you didn't need the apart from taking the corners you know the stability was there with one hand so really it was the 956 962 was the was sort of greatest all-round car i ever drove but i i drove a, a you know the ferrari um the ferrari t33 i mean 333 sp rather open cockpit sport that was that was that was like a grand prix car but it was a sports car now that was probably the most impressive car is sheer sort of driving at drivability but it's a grand prix car and a grand prix car is always going to be the best because yeah. it's the ultimate we all know that sophistication that's why we all come through racing to be and do formula one which i did a little bit of so they're pretty darn special but i must admit i think the most memorable was driving at Le Mans in the harris mclaren in my last year but one in when i was whatever was like 55 years old or something with my son justin and andy wallace and on father's day we finished third and we led the race for 16 hours all through the night in the pouring rain and we all did an amazing job and I'd retired the year before in other words I pulled out a racing and then I come on dad you've got to come back so I went back and to, to, to do that with your son is spectacular not many people in fact nobody's done that I don't think no um, you mentioned the 1970 race uh, when you were with Ferrari um, from what I understand that you were also uh, helping out with Steve McQueen on the filming of the movie Le Mans, which was filmed that year, which yes, was 49 years ago this year. Yes, it is. Yes. So, what, uh, how was your involvement in that movie? And because that was filmed during the actual race yeah, itself. Yes. Basically, uh, I've been in Formula One and Formula Two two years before that with Ferrari. It was a great experience. Probably not the wisest choice to race for Ferrari at that time because the cars weren't very good, and they pulled out of racing halfway through the second year. But I would never have missed it for the world. To drive for Enzo Ferrari with the greatest name probably in motor racing history was unbelievable. And I realized the more and more that I you know, get older, I realized how lucky I was. So having driven that first year with the Ferrari, prior to that I'd driven at Spa in my very first sports car race in a yellow Ferrari 512 for Jack Swatters, who's the importer of Ferrari into Belgium. And I drove for Jack and I was so thrilled to drive the car, did quite well, so that Mr. Ferrari saw how well I got at Spa in the car and so he invited me or actually told me I was going to drive for him back at the Le Mans or later in Le Mans in July and I didn't think I should I wanted to because I didn't feel that I'd necessarily been treated fairly because Ferrari had just sort of not provided us with the cars that we anticipated so I thought no why should I go back to him but in fact when I spoke to the team owner of my Ferrari or the Ferrari I drove I had driven at Spa he said Derek you've got to drive otherwise we won't get any spare parts for our for our for our Ferrari in the race. So I drove for Enzo with a wonderful Swedish driver called Ronnie Peterson. And so that was sort of, you know, how I ended up getting with Ferrari in my very first race. Mm. And, and what was it like with Steve, Steve McQueen being there, filming, and, 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 yes. and, and how did that get integrated into the race Well, itself? because at the end of, uh, whilst I was at the race, Jack Swatters, who had the yellow Ferrari that I'd driven at Spa, said to me, how about, you know, you, you drive with us, uh, you know, um, in, the, in the movie. Steve, I'm going to leave my car, they're going to lease it for the tournage of the film, and I'd, I'd be loved to have you driving it. Plus, as far as I was concerned, it was going to be painted red. But as far as I was concerned, I was going to get paid and you know as a driver you only got paid if you did drive racing you didn't get that much anyway so if I could get 100 quid a day every time I went out and, did, and was filming which was numerous mostly nearly every week for two and a half months it was really fantastic so I was very happy to do it and so that's how I really got involved with it but I drove the red Ferrari against the blue and orange uh, Steve McQueen car in the movie. Although, although you saw me, I had the same helmet on as the actors, so you never realised which one was which. Did you feel that that film did the the race itself justice, or is it a bit too much of a, Holly, a Hollywood presentation of what a Le Mans race was actually like? But the, I mean, we enjoyed working on it because we actually drove pretty darn fast all the time. We even had Steve in a lot of hilarious, well, dangerous in situations, but he was desperate. Steve wasn't keen about making a movie. He just wanted to race. The only way he could race was to f make it into a movie. And he didn't drive as much at certain points because the you know, production company said, come on, you know, you've got to get out there and direct it a little bit more. But um, no, he, 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 was, he was dead keen to do it. And it was, for us, it was just vital that we could, you know, 
think at my stage because I'd only I've only done two races in sports cars and there I was at Le Mans and you know driving with McQueen in the race or in the event so it was great experience. Uh, jumping forward to a uh, more contemporary question, um, there's been a lot of uh, news uh, this week because of the manufacturers who have announced we're taking part in the um, next year's hypercar class. Yes. Um, and a lot of people are wondering what your uh, kind of opinion is about hypercars now going to be the, the, the leading class and, and going for the outright win at Le Mans starting, I guess, Le Mans 2021 will be the first time they'll be racing here and what your feelings are on that. Um, sure, I'm a bit of a stickler for if something's working, why not leave it as it is? Having said that, I'm not so sure, to be honest, that this is working that well. Um, I would say the crowds are down a bit this year. They don't look quite as, ex as, as full as they were last year. One of the problems to my way of thinking is, and I'll be very honest because I'm not going to hold back about mm -hmm. this and you don't want me to, is that I think I believe the public want to see the big names there. They want to see Porsche versus Ferrari versus Alfa Romeo versus Jaguar versus Bentley versus Alfa, whatever. They want to see the names. There's too many names out there that aren't really respected as being racing cars. They're just a name on a car. They go, what the hell, ARS or a this, that and the mm. other. And I think that's where the names always make the difference. And the public come to see the cars that they love and they've watched for years, I think. Having said that, there's nothing to say that they can't bring in something new. And I think Le Mans is the greatest sports car race in the world, if not maybe the greatest overall show race-wise, longevity and everything. And you realize what it means. And it's on the public roads and it's on roads that go, you know, halfway down to Spain almost. It's fantastic what they have done here. So I think of all the, the, the organizers, the, the ACO, the ones that could bring in something very unusual uh, to encourage manufacturers to come in. Now, you know, I've always said, I think we've always felt that, you know, un unlimited budgets like with a Audi and Porsche and, and Toyota in the last few years have been astronomic and out of all proportion. Hence, you don't see Audi here and you don't see Porsche here. They've done their bit, they won their races and they've got out. And Toyota are hanging in there and have won once or twice now. Uh, but there's not really anybody to meet despite the rules being changed. They certainly have a massive advantage. But um, I think to have a new man, a new, a new sort of era, if you like, coming in, it might not dominate. And I think a tremendous amount of people will come to watch the new, the new era, if you like. It might not last very long at all. Um, maybe the manufacturers that we've heard of will come in and we'll see a Ferrari extra special car and, and so on. I don't know why, Is it because I believe if you're going to produce cars, it's got to be something that you can drive on the road. You might say, well, you can't drive no, you can't drive maybe 10% of these cars on the road. I don't mean as racers, but you know, you can see the 911s, you can yeah. Porsches, you can see the Corvettes and all these cars. You can buy one and take it on the road. And I think that class is terribly, terribly strong. But the other cars with no names, no real manufacturers' names involved, apart from Toyota, um, it, it, people d can't relate to it. Mm. And it was quite interesting watching the start of the race just now. They showed a lot of the GT cars for the first few laps, yeah. which I thought was not interesting, but was interesting in a way. Um, I don't like to get involved in it all, and I don't mind thinking that, you know, this ACO of all people, because they've always done some amazingly sort of daring things in their lives, and to, you know, to sort of dictate what's happening in the world of motorsport, which isn't always loved by everybody. But I think the race, wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt to have something outstanding, because still people would come and say, yeah, but it's a bloody supercar, it had 2,000 horsepower, what do you expect? That be that as it may, it's bringing excitement into motor racing, which might have got a bit mundane. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, questions around, l not just endurance racing, but um, uh, Formula One as well. Do you think that th that's something that's a problem with all motorsport at the moment, is, is how to keep it relevant yeah. To, to, yeah. to the people who are watching it? Yes, I do. Um, I think, yeah, I, I can't totally relate it to F1. I mean, F1 is, is a voice unto itself. And as I say, I did a bit. Um, but I think, I think the biggest problem has been the last few years is, is the electronic side of it and the fact that the car has become so electronic, you know, so many different gizmos on it to make it perfect. And so you, and it's very difficult to overtake, we all talk about that. And, and we, we've talked about it a lot even this last week actually with other drivers. It's, I, 
you have to you have to remember we're in the entertainment business. So we are here, right? There's a big crowd here. There's probably a couple hundred thousand people. Wonderful. The build-up's been massive. You've got the manufacturers in GT class. I said the outright class is interesting because you're seeing very fast cars go very fast, but um, and lots of great drivers out there. But I think the main interest will be in the GT because the guy that's come here in his say Porsche, the other guy that's come over here in his TDR, the guy that's come here, they come, they have their own passion for certain cars, and I think that still lends it by bringing in this suit, this hypercar thing. I don't think it'll hurt it at all. I think it might end up finishing hypercars. Who's going to spend that sort of money? And you might say, but yeah, winning Le Mans, yeah, but at a certain point, are they going to sell cars through building a hypercar? The whole point about it, we used to say, we think what wins on Sunday sells on Monday. And then pe people can't buy hypercars. What's the point of doing it? Apart from showing you've got unlimited budgets and you've probably got very clever engineers and you're proving a point and good for them if they can go it's like almost setting the land speed record have a go at it it's going to cost you a fortune you might do it the end of it what good is it doing you apart from that you get lots of medals and pats on the back um, it's it's certainly true and, and I think there's, there's there's so much excitement about it because the cars that with cars like the Valkyrie we knew that that car was coming we knew that it existed and now there's almost a race forming that it can take part yes. in yes. Um, uh, and the idea of a huge, naturally aspirated V12 being at the front of the pack again yes. at Le Mans gets a lot of people really excited. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it will. It has to appeal. I think you have to think of something new to, to bring life into it because, in my own opinion, what we're seeing the last year or two is not. It's racing. I mean, the drivers are driving brilliantly. The engineering, everything about it is massive. But there's not. It's not, there's not enough of it. Mm. You know, there's, there's five cars, four cars, three cars. It, it's not enough. The people are watching those damn beautiful GT cars because they can relate to it. Yeah. And I think when it becomes to this hypercar, they'll be, they won't be relating to what they drive. It'll just be the fact that they come to see something spectacular. And I think that is making a show of it. As I said, we're in entertainment. Mm. What do you think the, the, the reason is that Le Mans has endured so long uh, consistently for 87 years or, or however long it's been um, as something that is relatively outside the norm because um, endurance racing as a whole doesn't attract as much as attention as Le Mans but even individual Formula Ones even like the Monaco Grand Prix won't gather the attention that, that Le Mans does what is it about this race even beyond other 24 hour races Spa or uh, I, I, think, I think first of all you have to look at it in my opinion, and met all of us, somebody last night at a talk we were at, there was, which was already, we know this, there's three great races in the calendar. There's, De, there's Le Mans, there's Indy 500, and the Monaco Grand Prix, all for various different reasons. And they will all hold because of the name. And we talked about the name before. Why are they lasting? Because of their name. It hasn't changed from being the, let's, I, I don't want to malign any, any track, but it, it's still got a, you don't have to say what it is, Le Mans, Indy, and Monaco. Everybody knows what race is. Yeah. You don't have to explain it. They know they're the three major sports car races. And here we are wondering about the cars that make it. And there were several great names that were in it, and they're not in it now. And that's one of the downsides. If, if you can remember the paper, well, you wouldn't, because you're too young. But when I first came here, you weren't born. But in 1970, the newspapers were full of Porsche versus Ferrari. Yeah. OK? It didn't say in class two, it said Porsche versus Ferrari. And that brought the people in. I might say, well, the biggest crowd was two years ago. Well, that was right. You had Audi, Porsche, and Toyota. Three great names. Yeah. So therefore you had it. And I think that's really what we're talking about, you know, is, is having the name to really promote it. You're saying, well, you know, Le Mans stuck it for all these years, of course, because it's Le Mans. If they'd moved it to Clermont Ferrari, it wouldn't have survived. They moved it to Paul Ricard, it wouldn't have survived. But it's Le Mans, it's the city, the roads. The public can drive on these roads. You see them, they're out there drinking in the pubs on the corner, at, you know, at the, at, at the uh, Les Renaudières this morning, you know, yesterday yeah. afternoon, having a great lunch, going and doing wheelies up and down the, up and down the, up and down the, the motor, the, the, the road. It's fantastic, actually, when you think what it, what it and it's an old, an old French city with a million people in it or something. That, that kind of covers it from an uh, audience perspective. How about from a driver's perspective? Is it, is it, 
the, in terms of uh, enjoyment of the actual race, we were taking out the kind of the prestige of what it is, but in terms of the enjoyment of the, the track itself and driving it compared to the other great tracks of the world, there was a particular question around comparing it to the Nürburgring in terms yeah. of challenge and yes. enjoyment to drive. How does it stack up against the great kind of endurance tracks of the world? Um, the, the reason it's unique is because it's 24 hours. The Nürburgring has a touring car race, but it's not the same as what we're saying. You can't compare it. I love the Nürburgring. My favorite track probably is Spa in Belgium. Fantastic circuits because they're a driver's track, very tough to drive. I don't really enjoy 24-hour races. To me, it's damn hard work for 24 hours, and you're always conscious. Perhaps they're not so much these days, but we had to be conscious with the gear changes, as I've said. Don't overrun the brakes because they will overheat. You're gonna, we don't have to change the pads. We don't have to, because it, and if you wear them out, you know, we end up with, with caliper problems and you've got to change the discs. The discs take four minutes to change. The pads take 30 seconds. So, you know, be careful with that. Don't forget, use the brakes, because to change the gearbox, which of course, when you have to shift all the time, you're gonna take us 45 minutes to change until Audi could do it in four minutes, but then that was almost, they broke the rules to do that by changing the rules. So, um, so they suit them, but, um, and, and there's always gonna be questions and arguments about all that stuff. But um, the, no, this, this track is, this circuit is unique to this race. And if, if I said to you, oh, what a wonderful race that was at Nürburgring, you'd say, what race? Was it the Grand Prix? Yeah. Was it Formula Two? Was it Touring Car? And what was it that made it a great race? Yeah. Sure. 150, 160 corners. <coughs> it is a, a wonderful. I love racing there, don't get me wrong. And I would say in all the years I did it, I had the fastest lap there, that, you know, on a few occasions overall for the year in Formula 2 and stuff and sports cars. But um, every time I did a lap at the Nürburgring, I never did a perfect lap. You cannot get 172 corners perfect. And if you did, you'd be really quick. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And it's really almost impossible. But, and, and I'm not going to go into that, but it is really difficult. This track is very good, it's very smooth, it's very fast, there's a lot of G-force. Um, but it is very special and there's something about it. So it always will have longevity where the Nürburgring will, but for, because of what it is. Because of it's called the Nürburgring, the yeah. Green Hell, that's what it's about, is the, the danger of it. And 160 odd corners. It's, it's amazing to do it, and when you drive, I can't believe you got to know this and can, you know, can do it with your eyes shut. I can draw a map of it now, you know, but that's the way it is, and it is magnificent to drive. And I guess if you said to me, if you're where, if you had the choice to drive a really quick car tomorrow, where would you go? I'd say the Nurburgring, because I think it's so challenging. Mm. And to take somebody with you, which I've done in Porsches and things over the years, and even Bentleys actually, it's incredible to take somebody around in a really fast car around the Nurburgring, because you open bits of the track that they never knew existed. Mm. Um, last question, we've taken quite a bit of your time, and I do appreciate that. Uh, but we've been out here with Bentley, um, and we were both lucky enough to be taking part in the parade lap that Bentley put on for their centenary. Uh, I drove a very nice 2003 Azure, but you were in a Bentley blower. Yes. Um, which you are, uh, that, not that particular one, but the other Bentley the, uh, blower the that Bentley car, have. Yeah. Yes, you, you're quite familiar with that car. So what is it like taking a car of that kind of age and vintage out on track and, and pushing it like it may have been pushed when it was new? Um, I don't think I ever pushed it the way it was new. I mean, those greys were my heroes. How they did it for the hours that they did it is absolutely astonishing. And I have to admit, when I worked, started working with Bentley in 2000, that it was the least appealing car. I mean, I admired it, I loved it, I loved seeing somebody else drive it. Because mm -hmm. somebody else that knows how to drive it, it was a picture to watch and to listen to. And you can't, re you can't believe the, the engineering that went into making that car. And then you, the one I drove was W.O. Bentley's customer car, his demo car. And you go, you know, can you imagine W.O. Bentley drove that? And it was his creation. And you think that was his dream. And then you almost think about, and you know, Tori Bugatti's dream, and it was a different car totally. Yeah. But the same era, these two brilliant men built different cars. Anyway, in this particular case, we're talking about the Bentley, and uh, I wasn't that enthusiastic because at that point I was doing t a lot. Of, no, I wasn't testing and developing the, the race car, but I was working on that project, and I did drive it a hell of a lot. Uh, although I'd love to have driven it in the race, ultimately in the first race they did anyway. Um, and and so, yeah, getting back to the blower, it was sort of something on well, one day, who knows? And then I'm going, yeah, but they'll never let me out in a sort of who knows what valueless car, uh, you know, one would, I could go out in. But 
Uh, I've done several events. I've even driven one at the 24-hour classic here. And uh, he drove it brilliantly. He was magnificent in it. But I don't know it as well as he does. And it's a, it's a very difficult car to drive. Cars have got easier. You've got to realize cars have got easier. You know, it's like when you drove the 917s, for example. I have to use that analogy because I drove so many eras. Is that, you know, the car had certain vices to it. And you had to be aware of those vices. You drive the modern car, they either steer or oversteer. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And that, and that means the front slides or the back slides, uh, basically. And, of course, the engineers make them so perfect that really you have it so that neither end slides. You just get to that maximum speed. You can just change direction and go through the corner as you go. I mean, it's just fantastic, really. But I have to admit, you know, it's the art of driving. I mean, you know, we had to shift gear. In the, in the Bentley, as I have done in the 962s and all the cars I've driven. I've never driven a car at Le Mans, I don't think, without having to shift gear. So you have to be that much more subtle with the gear shift. You have to be gentle. I mean, you, you drive that blur around here, you're going, oh my goodness, I'm coming to that slow corner. I've got to go down to second gear from fourth. That takes a hell of a long time. It's not just a matter of pushing the clutch down and going down to second or whatever gear. You're actually thinking, how the heck is it going to go in? And so you have to get the clutch so far that you have to build the revs up, flick the revs up, push the clutch down, not all the way to the floor, because that goes too far with the clutch. You have to go so far, and you, it's only a matter of in, judgment where it is. And, whoop, and it'll go into gear. Or else you can spend the whole way around the corner, as I did today, trying to get down to third gear. And then you say, the hell with it. I'm going to pull over, get into first, and start all over again. It really isn't easy. But apart from that, the, ch the opportunity to drive a car that's 100 years old, basically, is just amazing. And you think what went into that, and you think of W.O. Bentley and his dream, and you, you know, you're out there driving it, and, and then you're driving the, his latest, or the latest creations under his name. And you'd be so proud of the stuff that they're building. And they really are wonderful cars. Um, on the way, there's some interesting moments when he obviously didn't have the, the, the finance to do a perfect job, but over the years, um, the cars have got a lot better, I thank goodness. Thanks, I think, really, one has to say to the BW Group's investment in it, which has allowed them to do things so perfectly. And the cars are magnificent now. And, but I have to say, the old cars still are, are, challenge, are challenging. But as I say, modern cars, you get in and you just drive them. Derek, we've taken a huge amount of time, and I really appreciate <laughs> you. you talking to My us. Pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You. My pleasure.